So, Maxime, take it away. <laughs> so, hey, everybody. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Maxime Marcot Boutier. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Politics at York University in Toronto, Canada. So, although I'm in the Department of Politics, I really study kind of the uh, the history of ideas around politics. Uh, so I'm more like a philosopher in that sense. And today I'm going to present to all of you. I'm really happy to have the privilege to be able to present here. And uh, the reason why is because a big the crux of my dissertation is about coming up with a Buddhist political theory of legitimacy. So what I mean, I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by that as I move further into the presentation. But uh, yeah, so my texts, I focus on translating texts from classical Japan from that are written in the Kamakura era. So like from 12th century to 14th century. And uh, for my dissertation, I translated about I'd say like, you know, 500, 600 passages it took me years. And uh, I only selected about like 10 or eight in this presentation. So there's a lot more going on and I'll be looking forward to uh, answer any more questions or clarification in the question period if it comes down to uh, to some of the stuff that's been left out. But yeah, so for today, the presentation is going to follow the uh, this format. So I'm just going to really real quick talk about what I mean by legitimacy and specifically why beliefs is very important when talking about legitimacy. Then the texts that I'm translating are from uh, Esai, Dogen, and Nichiren. So these are three authors that basically are part of what is kind of the so-called like reformist Buddhist traditions of the Kamakura period. Uh, there were all Tendai monks that kind of branched off to do their own thing. Uh, Esai is a little different. He's kind of remained a Tendai monk. But Dogen started the Soto Zen tradition, Nichiren started the Nichiren tradition, and, and um, Eisai kind of imported Rinzai Zen to Japan. Uh, so they're, they're very kind of important cultural figures and historical figures in the Buddhist tradition of Japan, and that's why I picked them. Um, so what I do is I'm going to present to all of you some of my translations, so the classical Japanese and my translations. Uh, it's going to be like very scattered. But as we're going to navigate these passages, we're going to see that some of the themes kind of keep repeating themselves. And after going through all of them, I'm going to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together to come up with one kind of systematized Buddhist political theory of legitimacy, as it would have been understood by uh, these figures in the kind of medieval Japan. Um, and then at the end of that, I'm going to talk about a little bit how can it be useful for us in the present. And hopefully you will also see some usefulness in that. And I'm not the only one that's uh, delusional to think that it's useful. Okay, so um, the theory of legitimacy that I'm working with is coming from Max Weber. And what Weber has basically found or presented in his own research is that no structure of authority are legitimate in themselves. They're only legitimate when they emerge from and are anchored in beliefs. So. A clarification that's very important here is that beliefs in this context is not necessarily, you know, like in the modern day, we think beliefs is like, you know, personal opinion, religious positions, that kind of stuff. Uh, belief is really kind of like what is perceived to be true, like the facts, the 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 German word that Weber uses. I'm not going to pronounce it because I don't speak German, but it's basically translated as the matters of fact of a particular society. So things that we all kind of agreed to be true to an extent that we almost don't question them anymore. And these are the beliefs that we're talking about here. Uh, so the matters of fact of, for example, Munchen Sensei talk in the presentation, I think two weeks ago about how, you know, Japan operates, for example, within a system that assumes kami, the deities to be tr to be real and to be true. Well, for us, they're just beliefs, you know, but for them, they're matter of fact. So it's this kind of belief that we're talking about. Our matter of fact are not going to be the same of a different culture's matter of fact. And my dissertation is trying to figure out what are the matter of fact that are present in the text of medieval Japanese thinkers and how did that influence the way that they understood legitimacy and legitimate power. 
So we're going to dive right into it. Just to give you a little idea, uh, a lot of my passages are, some of them are long. So when they're longer, I just paraphrase it. I just kind of give you the, you know, the straight, like the, the nitty gritty of what the passage means, because or else this presentation could last hours. So um, Esai, I mentioned, is kind of the imported Rinzai Zen uh, in Japan, uh, but he decided to remain a Tendai monk. And in his monastery, he taught, he taught, equally Rinzai, Shingon, and Tendai practices and teachings in his uh, in his monasteries. So the first passages that we're going to look at is this one that says that the Buddha Dharma must unmistakably be caused to disseminate as a result of the ruler's charity. It is because of this that the Buddha courteously entrusted the safeguarding and spreading of the Buddha Dharma to rulers. And in addition to that, uh, the ruler's blessings is going to be immense. So here, in a nutshell, um, we see that two things, that the, the Buddha gave the Buddha Dharma specifically to rulers. And if rulers do a good job of spreading the Dharma, then blessing is going to ensue. It's going to result. Second passage. Uh, again, this is a longer one, so I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, in a nutshell... Um, people of poor and low status who will turn up and speak abusively using shame and insult. So imagine, you know, that you, they're, you're a ruler and then people are going to come at you and kind of like, you know, shame you and insult you. And they're going to be like, what the hell are you doing? Um, so there, here there's a guideline of how rulers should behave. So rulers should not show their punishing power. They should remember that as the rulers, they should use the Dharma to distribute peace equally. And specifically, the following thoughts should come into the ruler's mind. So you can picture the scene. There's somebody that's kind of yelling insults at you. Then you should remember, in the distant past, before the world honored Buddha, I uttered the great vow, which is the Bodhisattva vow. For the sake of the entirety of all beings, I vowed that I will get rid of suffering and save everything from illusion and will cause their attainment of unsurpassed, complete, proper, and perfect enlightenment. At this time, if hatred is stirred up, then this does not match the primordial vow. So imagine, so basically here there's like a, a bodhisattva model for governance. Uh, the... The ruler was someone in the past that uttered the Bodhisattva vow in front of the Buddha, and they need to behave in accordance with that vow that says that they should try to get rid of suffering and not perpetuate it. So if you become, if hatred is stirred up in your heart while someone's yelling at you, then it doesn't match the vow. So it's, in this sense, it's illegitimate. It's bad governance. Secondly, all beings... If they pray with their hearts and safeguard with their mouths, the diamond kings will always appropriately follow as they are told. So this is a little more like I'd have to put the entire passage for it to make a little more sense. But basically what it says is if with all of your heart, with like, you know, like pure faith and very much wholeheartedly you pray and you do all of that stuff, then the diamond kings, which are uh, Buddhist deities, they're the uh, like the protectors of the Dharma. So they will always follow as they're told, which in this sense aligns with blessings. So if you ask for blessing, if you ask for protection, then they're going to be told as they're done if you pray wholeheartedly with all of your heart. Even though you might have a disturbed heart, if you're very sincere in uh, your prayers and demands, then you will receive protection from these beings. And lastly... Uh, if the power of meditation is absent, the destruction of evil is difficult. Therefore, by means of this, in this case, the Zen tradition, the importance of protecting the nation becomes carried out. So basically, Zen and Buddhist practices in general are means of protecting the nation because they allowed for evil, for the, the, the destruction of evil, basically. So this is some of the key ideas that are stemming out of Asai's context, of Asai's text. Now, we're going to contrast it first with what happens in Dogen and then Nichiren, and then we're, again, we're going to pile up together. But just keep these in mind because the ideas are going to be are like recycled in different ways. So if we go to Dogen, Dogen mentions that due to widely spreading the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma, multiple Buddhas and multiple deities ceaselessly protected as a result. 
And there's a great piece as a result of the ruler's beneficial influence. So we can see here again the similar idea. If the ruler spreads the Dharma, protection results. Um, here it adds a little, little, a little thing that's important is that uh, spreading the Dharma must happen or it must wait for an imperial decree. So Dharma doesn't happen if kind of like the emperor hasn't or if the ruler hasn't kind of officialized it. And then it gives a very interesting passage that I forgot to highlight here, but it says, basically people in position of power, so whether you're a ruler, an official, a counselor, minister, whatever, um, they all received the Buddhist teaching and they made the, an, the original vow in the past, in their past life, that they would protect and preserve the Buddha Dharma. And that means that these people are people that would kind of do it naturally. It's like, I made the vow back in the day that I would pr protect the Dharma. So now that I am in this particular rebirth, it happens very naturally for me to protect it because I have this karmic inheritance of the vow that I did in the past. The next passage. Um, so he basically trashes on, on rulers, basically saying that they let days and night pass in vain. They're caught in their sensory desires. They do not leave the household, which means uh, taking taking um, monkhood, becoming a monk. Um, and then it says, though the rulers have fame, the virtue of rulers is non-existent. They lust insatiably and they cannot stay put. And as a result of cultivating the way and leaving the household, the various deities rejoice, rejoicefully watch over and protect, and the divine serpents, the Naga, reveredly safeguard and preserve. So here you see that there's another model for governance. You know, if you govern in a way that is not in alignment with basically with the Buddhist precepts, um, then there's no virtue and it's bad governance. But if you cultivate the Buddhist way and you take the monk vows, then you're going to receive protection. So you see, again, in all of these contexts, protection is very important and protection from uh, following the Buddhist way and uh, spreading the Dharma more specifically. If we switch to Nichiren, uh, Nichiren first mentions, again, very similar way to the previous two, that Buddha Dharmas are first transmitted to rulers of nation and then it goes to the four kinds of practitioners. So the four kinds of practitioners is monk, nuns, laywoman, and layman. Uh, so it's the Buddha, the Dharma is given to rulers, and then it's like their job to spread it to the rest. Um, and this is the proper way to govern a nation. The Buddha, the Dharma goes to the ruler, and then it's the ruler's job to spread it. Following this, it says that if rulers do not protect the Dharma, then even though they might have done amazing thing in the in for immeasurable lifetimes in the past, even if they did all giving precept, wisdom, all that stuff, all of their meritorious efforts will be entirely destroyed if they don't protect the Dharma. Uh, and then bad stuff is going to happen in the in the country, which we're going to talk about a little bit uh, later in two passages. Here it says, when there are bad deeds of unwholesome rulers and monks, they damage the correct dharma, and then uh, the path of heavenly beings decline. The various deities and wholesome deities who show compassion towards all being of the ruler will abandon this nation of impurity and unwholesomeness. So here it's important because, uh, again, it brings forth the concept of purity and impurity. So the nation becomes impure. So people the rulers and the population lives on an impure in an impure nation when bad actions are done when the correct dharma is is damaged and all that stuff and that means that uh the deities who show compassion are, are going to leave and protection is not going to result from that so as you as you quickly saw uh, the next passage is a really long one, so I'm really going to paraphrase it because it's uh but I just really wanted to put it out there to emphasize the the pattern that we see coming here it says uh in the golden light sutra it says that if there's a person so imagine that there's a person and within a country the golden light sutra exists like the golden light sutra is present in a particular country but in this person that lives in the in this country where the sutra exists the person has a heart of indifference 
right? So basically, it's like they don't care. They don't care about the sutra. They don't care about the teachings. But to the extent that they, they don't care, they have so much indifference towards the sutra that even if they see somebody else uh, praying to it or meditating on it or reciting it, they're going to be like, oh, like this is useless. Right? So when there's that heart of indifference that originates, then if we go back to the the, the middle of, of the, the paragraph here, it says the deities will abandon the nation because their hearts of protection will no longer exist. So your heart of indifference makes the heart of protections of the deities leave and uh, then the nation will unmistakably have all kinds of calamities. And there's a list here, but I'm going to just mention the first one because I think it's very important. Um, in the in everyone, basically, everybody will lose their wholesome heart. So the good heart in people will leave, and that's going to result in discrimination, binding, attachment, killing, harm, anger, quarrel, defamation, etc. And... All of this eventually is also going to evolve to become, you know, like having two suns in the sky and stars disappearing and uh, invasion and sufferings and all, all stuff of calamities is going to happen. Um, yeah. So basically, it's uh, you need to make sure to spread the teaching and have a good heart, because if you don't have a good heart, then all the bad stuff happened because the, the deities that protect the country are going to leave. So if I put this into a, the coherent whole, the first thing that we see appearing constantly is that rulers have karmically inherited their position of power. And that means they have the responsibility to use that power to disseminate the Buddhist teachings, protect them, and act in accordance with them. That's very important because it's not just oftentimes people forget the, the kind of responsibility aspect of karmic theory. Uh, it's just kind of like thinking in a more like deterministic way of like, you know, oh, you're just born in that position because of karma. Yeah, but that also means that it gives you a particular duty. And in this case, the rulers have more power. They they karmically were born as rulers because they did the Buddha vow in the past, the original Bodhisattva vow, sorry. So they've generated a lot of like positive karma and that made them be in position of authority, in position of power in their current life. But then that means they need to use that power to spread the Dharma. So you have the responsibility. You're there because of karma. So you have to use that to spread the teaching. And so when the actions of the rulers are good, then they receive protection. If the actions are bad, then you don't get protection. A second theme is that in order for actions to be good, they need to be done with the right heart, with a pure heart in this case. So this pure heart is attained by following the Buddhist teachings, which guide the practitioner in getting rid of the delusion that arise in the present, as well as the one that they karmically inherited in the past. So you want your actions to be good, and that means you have, they have to be done with a pure heart. And the Buddhist teaching is, is giving you a guideline as to how to be able to achieve that. Having an unpurified heart makes a being produce action that will result in negative consequences. As we saw in the last passage, it's going to lead to even like calamities in the nation. But having a purified heart makes a being produce action that will result in positive consequence. And in that regards of the kind of what is the right heart, what is the pure heart, what does it look like? Well, it's in alignment with the original Bodhisattva vow. So the, the Bodhisattva model of, you know, compassion, wanting to get rid of suffering, this is kind of like the template that we to follow. So crossing to the other shore only once all being have crossed over themselves. So it's your duty as a ruler to make sure that you help guide beings towards enlightenment. And also the ruler must act like a Bodhisattva, so with compassion and for the benefit of others. So... This is, it's a little bit of a lot. And I, what I try to do is I, I try to put this into a graph, which it doesn't do justice to the intricacies or whatever, but I want people to kind of have a clear kind of template of what that would look like that could even be imported into like daily lives today uh, for people who would like that. So it would kind of look something like this. So if you have a pure heart, it leads to good actions, which produces good results. How do you get a pure heart? Is by following the Buddha's path. 
if someone does that, follows the Buddhist path, have a pure heart, and therefore produces good actions that leads to good result for the benefit of all, that's a legitimate ruler. And, and an illegitimate ruler is the opposite. Someone who has an impure heart that does bad action, that leads to bad results, therefore they're an illegitimate ruler. But the beauty of the, uh, the you know, East Asian or Asian, like, causality system is that all of this can be reversed. It's not linear, as in the, the Western model that we have. So if you flip it around, you could also kind of like do like backward deduction. So if you see a good result, you can deduce that it means that the action was good, and therefore you can deduce that the person has a pure heart. And again, a pure heart is the Buddhist path. So I'm wrapping up here by trying to talk about why all of this might be useful for us today as Buddhist practitioners. So first of all, it presents a karmic-based understanding of political power. So oftentimes, you know, in discussions of religion because of the secular biases of the Eurocentric knowledge system, uh, we want to separate power and, and uh, sorry, government and um, religion. Um, but sometimes like as a practitioner, if you want to be able to evaluate, you know, like people in position of power, and that's not just, you know, like politicians, it's also like, uh, you know, the leader of a household, for example, or the leader of, you know, for example, like, um, Monshin Sensei could be, is like the leader of this community, for example, like anybody in leadership position, it's not just ruler at the political level. So it presents a karmic way of understanding political dynamics. So it explains that people have been placed in position of power because of their karmic circumstances. And that means that they also have a responsibility to follow and act to the benefit of others because their position of power is inherited from the vow, the bodhisattva vows that they've done in the past. So they have a duty to fulfill that vow, to aspire to fulfill that vow in this lifetime, which means they need to help others in the bodhisattva way. So in this sense, karma might set you up for particular political and social circumstances, but you have the power to change these circumstance, circumstances, for better or worse, through your actions. It also offers a system of evaluation for legitimate power embedded in the Buddhist teachings, so how to evaluate uh, leaders. And basically, the template looks like something like this. Leaders need to constantly do the self-work of purifying one's heart so that their action bring about good results that benefit all. It also provides a way for followers to hold leaders accountable. So leaders need to remember and behave in accordance with the Bodhisattva vow that they have done in the past that allows them to rule now. Also, it justifies political change. So after careful examination, of course, but you can, like, you can use this method to evaluate whether a leader is legitimate or not. And if they're not, then it justifies political change to have someone there that would be leading in accordance to this particular model. But it also offers a framework for political action, right? So it's not just for leaders, but it's also for, you know, the, the followers or for the, 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 the subjects within the case of, of uh, like medieval Japan. So the template for a good political actor, it's basically the same as a good ruler. An actor needs to constantly do the self-work of purifying one's heart so that their action bring about good result that benefits all. So your political act activism should be aimed in the same kind of bodhisattva ideal of trying to benefit all, alleviate suffering, spreading the teachings, etc. Also, it provides a way for followers to hold themselves and each, each other accountable, not just the leaders. So political action must come from a place of compassion and seek the benefit and emancipation of all. So with all of this, we have the, the framework of what legitimate governments or legitimate power dynamics can be understand through the lens of a Buddhist framework. And all of this comes out of frameworks of medieval Japan, Japanese Buddhist writers. But I still think that there's stuff that is salvageable for us today in terms of including our kind of like Buddhist framework into a sphere that normally 
like Buddhist or uh, not Buddhist, but like religious thoughts tend to want to be excluded, which is about politics and, and power dynamics in general. So the thing that I like to do to try to do that, how can we integrate that into our, our lives, into a daily day, into a more daily way? I like to do a kind of thought experiment, which in this case, I just kind of ask a bunch of questions. And the goal is, my goal is not to answer them, is just to kind of help you frame things in a different way. So the question I'd like to ask is, what would happen if we stop basing the legitimacy of our modern politicians on their actions and rather focus on the result of their action? So do their action result in helping to alleviate suffering and bring about collective liberation for all? So that's the thing that's important in karmic theory is that the, the result is the thing that tells you like whether the person has a good heart, you know? And in this sense, you... I think that in a lot of what politics is today, we tend to focus on the action of the politician, like, oh, the politician did this, you know, like they put forth that policy or they sent money to that organization or that kind of stuff. You focus on the action. But when you look at the result of the action, the result might not actually always be good. You know, you can have an action that is very good, but the result of the action might be that it increased uh, systemic racism, for example. So then if you look at the result of what the actions of politicians are, it gives you a different way to analyze whether they are fit to rule or not. Second question is, what would happen if we started basing the legitimacy of our modern politicians on the quality of their characters and hearts rather than their actions? So again, shift the model away from just the action. You look at the result, and the result is supposed to tell you within that model what kind of heart they have. And if we judge whether they're legitimate or not, is basically based on their hearts and not necessarily on the action itself. So it shifts the focus on what to look at when you tend to try to understand if someone's legitimate to rule or not. And the last one, which I think is really interesting, is that what would happen if we turn to environmental factors to establish whether our modern politicians are fit to rule or not? So as we can see in all of the models that we've seen that came from medieval Japan, uh, you know, like bad governance leads to calamities of all sorts and oftentimes environmental ones at that. So like, could we see relationship between the circumstances that we are with environmental factors and try to understand if that is supposed to tell us something about the political systems that we have and the people that are in position to make decisions because they're in power position? So again, what shape would our political systems and decision-making take if we move away from an anthropocentric model of measurement for political legitimacy? So if we move away from only focus on what humans do and human stuff, and if we look at non-human actors, what can that, that tell us about the systems that we have and the people that are in position of power within the system? So these are all questions that are just prompts to kind of help us think as if we would be like a medieval Japanese Buddhist thinker that tries to evaluate whether their system of governance or the person in, in place in government is legitimate or not. And that is basically my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maxine. And I'm going to, to uh, take the privilege of asking uh, the first question. And it and it really is just defining something that you've been talking about. And I have a second question after that. When you're saying um, the, the ruler's heart, are we speaking of Kokoro or are we speaking of character? No, we're speaking of Kokoro. So it's like mind, heart, and spirit. Okay. Okay. That I, was, I wasn't sure which which we're talking about. Yeah. And Thank you. That's, that's, that's an important clarification. Yeah. Okay. And then the second, the second question is sort of a little bit more granular, mm -hmm. and that has to do with looking at these three people and looking at the fact that the Bakufu had switched from Kyoto to Kamakura during mm -hmm. this period of time, from the Heian period to the Kamakura period. Do you think that any of these three, but especially the first two, especially mm -hmm. when we're dealing with um, um, Isai and Dogen, you think that they were also using that as a way to characterize the distinction between the Tenno, the emperor, mm -hmm. contrasted to the um, shogun 
uh, because they were seeking patronage from the shogun uh, in Kamakura. And I'm just wondering if, if, there, if that may have been part of the motive was to say, let's contrast and compare mm -hmm. the Tenno to the shogun. Yeah. No, that's an, that's an important question. Thanks for asking. It's, um, I would say that the, so the, the, the thing is that it's part of what I'm like within the, the broader context of, of my research, it's like, I try to focus on understanding kind of like the switch between Heian to Kamakura and the general thinking is that, well, if there's a change of governance, then what kind of belief system is there to legitimize this new form of government, right? And people would tend to assume that, well, because it's a new government, then it needs a different set of beliefs to legitimize them. But when you compare the text written in Heian period, so part of my dissertation, I also translated text from the Heian period, specifically non-Buddhist texts, and a text of political history that is not from a Buddhist perspective as well. And no matter whether you look at Heian or whether you look at Kamakura or non-Buddhist texts or Buddhist texts, they all have a similar framework. And the similar framework is that the result of your action is determined by the purity of your heart. And that belief system that the result of your action is determined by the purity of your heart it's basically the belief system that's just transferred over to understand politics. So the belief system remains the same. Now it's just made to understand politics instead of understanding just stuff about life in general. So whether people talked about the emperor or talked about the shogun, whatever, they still use the same belief system to evaluate whether they were legitimate or not. So the, the thought, so the change in government did not change the way people thought about politics or thought about government the belief were exactly the same even after the change from Heian to Kamakura okay that, that's really useful thank you very much and my pleasure uh Ichishima sensei did you have any questions or comments that you would like to make thank you uh it's quite interesting uh research on these uh, medieval Japanese politics and the rulers and also such uh, famous uh, Buddhist, Eisai, Dogen, and Nichiren. I think uh, these people are very, uh, I think, uh, made the Japanese foundation of mind, uh, mind purity, etc. And uh, so especially in the Kamakura period, Bushido or grow, very such, a, you know, ma martial arts kind of things are very uh, popular. And in that case, uh, they must have a pure mind, as uh, the speaker mentioned. And uh, so uh, it is quite interesting to uh, think of such uh, rulers and uh, political rulers and also Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, priests, how to think of these uh, politics. Uh, and mind is very important anyway. And so this is my impression. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Yes. Thank you for your comment.